Welcome to your web lecture on the extant diversity of vertebrates. Three of the main goals of this, what I want you to get out of it are, number one, I want you to focus in on the major transitions in vertebrate history. We're going to be talking a lot about these in class, at what point in evolutionary history these can transitions occurred and what the major effects of that transition were. Second, I'd like you to take note of the, what we call dichotomous splitting, the splitting of branches on the evolutionary tree into two separate lineages and what are the two sister taxa that resulted from that splitting. And thirdly, names of groups, the ones that I mention in this web lecture are the ones that I want you to know and understand and be able to use. So keep an eye out for those three things as we go through the living vertebrates. This earliest part of the tree is the subject of some controversy. So we'll work on this in class a fair bit. This relationship between hagfish and lampreys is actually somewhat controversial. So we'll go through the details of that in class, but for the purposes of this web lecture, we've got a major set of synapomorphies of shared derived characters that lampreys share with the rest of the vertebrates that hagfish do not share. So we're going to put these synapomorphies here applying to lampreys and the rest of the vertebrates. And of course this is the presence of vertebrae. Secondly, all of these groups have two semicircular canals in their inner ear. So these are organs that are involved with detecting the orientation of your body in space. And so there are two of them in, in this group that includes lampreys and the rest of the vertebrates. And also radial fin muscles. So they have muscularized fins that are under active control. So in the case of lampreys, these are just dorsal fins. Uh, hagfish do not have muscularized fins. So hagfish and lamprey are sometimes joined together in a group called cyclostomes that refers to the fact that they do not have jaws in their mouths. This is clearly an ancestral character, right? You had no jaws before you had jaws. This is not a basis for joining them together in a clade, but there are some similarities at the molecular level that suggest perhaps they should be together in a clade as the sister taxon to the rest of the vertebrates rather than separated. So let's take a look at what these different organisms look like. So this is the charming hagfish. Hagfish, again, have no jaws. They generally live at the bottoms of oceans and feed on detritus, so dead and decaying animals. They use their jawless mouth to sort of suck off bits of the decaying carcass. Um, they're perhaps best known for the production of this uh, substance, this is hagfish slime, they produce it all over their body and this is one of their defenses, producing this layer of slime to make it hard for predators to grab onto them. So they're also sometimes known as slime hags. The lamprey also lacks a jaw, but it has this circular mouth with these keratin-based tooth-like structures. These are not actual teeth because they're made of keratin, We'll go into more details about what constitutes a true tooth as we come to that in the semester. So they have this sort of funnel-shaped mouth surrounded by these horny keratin teeth that they use to attach themselves to uh, generally vertebrates. So they attach by their mouth parts and suck blood out of their hapless victims. So here you see a spot where the lamprey has been removed from this poor fish. This is an attached lamprey here, one here. So these are generally sort of a, a parasitic, blood-sucking, jawless vertebrate. So the first really major transition in the evolution of vertebrates was the origin of jaws. And we'll go into great detail on how these jaws evolved, what are the parts that they evolved from in their jawless precursors. But obviously, having these muscular, tooth-bearing jaws made them much, much, much more effective predators, allowing them to consume larger and larger prey organisms. And this made them really the most dangerous predators in the early oceans with the origin of jaws. So the group of vertebrates that possess jaws are known as nathostomes and their synapomorphies are obviously the presence of jaws. The number of pharyngeal slits they possess has been stabilized to five. And these pharyngeal slits are supported by skeletal elements, 
known as visceral arches, also sometimes known as branchial arches. And so these allow the attachment of muscles onto the skeletal elements to allow those slits to expand and contract. So this group of vertebrates also has paired appendages, as opposed to just the midline appendages that we saw in things like lamprey, this dorsal fin. Now there are paired lateral appendages, the pectoral fins and the pelvic fins are seen just in the nathostomes or the jawed vertebrates. We also begin to see paired nostrils as compared to the single nostril found in the lamprey. And now rather than two semicircular canals, remember these organs that detect changes in the body's orientation, now we see three semicircular canals. And these three semicircular canals are oriented perpendicular to each other, so they're able to detect rotations of the body in three dimensions rather than just two. So this indicates use of the water column in addition to just the bottom of the ocean. You only need to detect side to side movement if you're basically a bottom dweller, but if you're going to be traveling up into the water column in three dimensions, you need to have that third semicircular canal to detect up and down movements. So the two groups of nathostomes, the first split here among the nathostomes, gives us two major lineages. One is the chondrichthys, and these are the cartilaginous fishes, such as sharks, skates, rays, and ratfish. The other branch leads to everything else on this cladogram, and we call this group the osteichthys, or the bony fish. And so those are the rest of the nathostomes that are not cartilaginous fish, including actual fish with bony skeletons. So let's first take a look at the chondrichthys. Here are some examples of different kinds of sharks and rays. This is the, the ratfish. It's a very interesting looking organism. So these chondrichthys are characterized by a cartilaginous skeleton, sometimes calcified cartilage, so it can actually be a very strong but a lightweight skeleton. So chondrichthians tend to control their buoyancy or their ability to rise in the water column by having very low density lipids in a very large liver. So they have a huge liver that's filled with these low density lipids that help it to have not quite so great a tendency to sink to the bottom. So now let's take a look at this other group, the osteichthys represented by the groups in this box. So the main synapomorphies that distinguish the osteichthys are first endochondral ossification. So that means the ossification of the internal skeleton. We'll talk about the difference between that and other kinds of ossification as we go. This is the origin of having that internal bony skeleton. They also have an operculum, which is a bony cover for those pharyngeal slits to protect their delicate gills. And they control their buoyancy or their ability to, to rise and fall in the water column using an organ called a swim bladder. So this is a gas-filled organ that they can actually add gas to or remove gas from depending on whether they want to move up or down in the water columns. That is a synapomorphy of the osteichthys. So the osteichthys have two major branches, so here is their splitting point. One branch is the actinopterygii, these are the ray-finned fishes, and the other group is called sarcopterygii, or lobe-finned fish, except that that grouping includes lots of things that aren't fish as well, so lobe-finned fish as well as the rest of the vertebrates. So let's first take a look at the actinopterygians. These are most of the fish that you would recognize as fish okay, have, are these ray-finned fishes. So everything from seahorses to salmon and trout and other um, fish that are good to eat, um, pretty aquarium fish, moray eels, all of them are these ray-finned actinopterygians. And if we look at the diversity of vertebrate species, so this is a pie chart showing how many species there are in different groups, you can see that among these groupings, the actinopterygian is by far the most species rich of these individual groups, if you think of these as kind of their own taxa. But it's important to keep in mind that everything around this other half of the circle are also sarcopterygians. They're part of this other lineage. And so we, we end up getting about equal diversity between the actinopterygians and the sarcopterygians. 
the Sarcopterygians have just diversified a lot more than the Actinopterygians have into higher level taxonomic groups. So the Sarcopterygii, if we think of them as the low fin fish, include species such as the coelacanth, which is considered to be a living fossil. It was long thought to have been extinct for something like 80 million years until one was pulled up off the coast of South Africa in the 1930s. You can read the story about that in your textbook. It's very interesting. Also things such as lungfish are part of this group here and here, as well as all of the land-living vertebrates all are part of this clade called Sarcopterygii, commonly known as lobe-finned fish. And the reason they're called lobe-finned fish is that they actually have a bony structure that extends all the way into their fins. So ray-finned fish would just have kind of a bony base with fin rays, these little bony fin rays coming off of it. The Sarcopterygii are characterized by having this, this skeletal and muscular framework that extends all the way through the fin. And so this is a very likely precursor to the bony limbs of tetrapods once we move on to land. And so we'll talk a lot about that transition from this kind of Sarcopterygian fin that has a bony framework, but also fin rays to a land-dwelling tetrapod limb that has pretty much the same series of bones in it and ends in toes rather than fin rays. So the next split from this lineage of Sarcopterygians are called the tetrapods. And here we have another major transition in the history of vertebrates. The transition to land included um, a large number of different evolutionary novelties to be able to survive on land. And again, we'll talk in great detail in class about what all the challenges were, but you can probably imagine many of them, the importance of retaining water so that you don't dry out when you're on land, the ability to hold up your body weight on the surface. You don't have water kind of supporting your body weight anymore. You need strong limbs to be able to push your belly up off the surface. Lots of different features associated with this transition to land in this group called tetrapods. So tetrapods consist of all of the land-dwelling vertebrates, even if they have secondarily readapted to an aquatic habitat. And so tetra means four, poda means feet. So these are fundamentally four-footed species, although they also include species that are descendants of four-footed species that no longer have legs, such as snakes, dolphins, other members that have secondarily lost those four legs. So the tetrapods consist of two major lineages. One of them is the amphibians, so that includes newt salamanders and frogs. The other major lineage is called the amniotes, so this is all the rest of the tetrapods besides amphibians. The amphibians include lots of species that live on both land and water, that's what the name amphibian means, and one of the features of amphibians is that the eggs they lay are very delicate, not very waterproof structures. So all of the amphibians are reliant to some extent on finding some source of water to lay their eggs in. They've never become fully independent of the water. So that can be either a pond to lay your eggs in or it can just be in the case of some of these um, tree frogs and things like that, finding a cup-shaped leaf that has gathered up some rainwater to lay eggs in, but they need to have some source of water for their reproduction. The amniotes, on the other hand, the other side of this tetrapod lineage, is characterized by the evolution of something called the cleidoic egg. So the cleidoic egg is surrounded by a waterproof shell of some kind that makes the amniotes um, relatively independent of water for the purpose of reproduction. Obviously, their bodies need to stay hydrated, but they don't actually have to find bodies of water or sources of water to be able to reproduce. The cleidoic egg creates a watery microenvironment within the egg that is sufficient for the development of the fetus. So that is the common feature of this group called the amniotes, and the amniotes consist of basically all of the tetrapods, excluding the amphibians. So the amniotes are divided into two lineages. So here's the split between the seropsida, which include the birds and reptiles, and the synapsida, which includes all of the mammals. 
So here are some examples of synapsids and sauropsids, all of the different species of mammals which are characterized by fur and mammary glands are part of the synapsid lineage. So kangaroos and bats and seals and mice, all of the amniotes that continue to lay these cleidoic eggs are part of the sauropsid lineage and include such things as snakes, birds, dinosaurs, and turtles. So let's take a look at the sauropsid family tree in particular. So here we have the split between synapsids coming up to the left here and sauropsids coming up to the right. So let's skip this part for the time being and look at this major division here in the sauropsids. So the sauropsids are divided into two major groups, the lepidosaurs here and the archosaurs. So those are the two major groupings of sauropsids. And the placement of turtles relative to these groups is, at this point, uncertain based on the evidence. So it had long been thought that turtles belonged here, branching off from the sauropsids before the split between the lepidosaurs and the archosaurs. But more recent evidence suggests that they actually belong in this clade along with the lepidosaurs and archosaurs. But it's still not clear whether they should be part of this lepidosaur lineage or part of the archosaur lineage. So what we see here is the lepidosaurs consist of the snakes and lizards as well as another group called the tuataras, also known as sphenodon. That's the genus name for this group. The archosaurs consist of birds, dinosaurs, and crocodilians. So here are some examples of lepidosaurs, different snakes and lizards. Um, this is the tuatara that you see here um, in the middle. It looks mostly like a lizard, but has some specialized features that we'll talk about later. The archosaurs are distinguished by some features of the skull. So they have a couple of holes in their skull that are particular to archosaurs. These are called fenestri. Fenestra is the singular. It literally means window. And so they've got one hole in their skull in front of their orbit or their eye socket and another one in the middle of their jaw. So this is common to all of the archosaurs. And they're also characterized by a very particular pattern of airflow in their lungs. They have unidirectional airflow in a special kind of lung called a favular lung. We'll talk much, much more about that when we get to respiration, particularly with respect to birds. So here are some examples of archosaurs, all of our little feathered friends, the birds, our extinct friends, the dinosaurs, and then also all of the crocodilians, so the, like this gharial or this American alligator. So our final grouping is the mammals among the synapsids. So the two synapomorphies that distinguish the mammalian group are hair and the protection of milk or lactation. The mammals are separated into three main lineages. The most basal consists of the platypus and echidnas. These are called the monotremes. Don't worry too much about that name. But these are mammals that actually do still lay eggs. So these are egg-laying mammals. And then the other branch consists of the two groups of therian mammals. So there's the metatheria, those are the marsupial mammals of Australia, and then there are the eutherian or placental mammals. This distinction between supporting fetal development using a placenta to exchange blood with the mother as compared to having a very early birth without the formation of a true placenta in the case of the marsupials and finishing development within a pouch in the mother's body and completing most of the development outside of the uterus. So here are examples of lots of different kinds of mammals. So this is one of those monotremes, non-therian mammals, egg-laying mammals. This is the platypus, an example of a metatherian marsupial. This is a kangaroo, and then a number of different placental mammals that we know and love. So for those of you who did watch the uh, crash course video on the chordates and Hank posed the question to you, who do you think you are? He gave what I consider to be a fairly incomplete and very sort of Linnaean taxonomic answer to that question. So over the course of this semester, I will call you many nasty names such as lobefin fish and bony fish. I'm not sorry, this is cladistically quite correct. So here is the cladistic list of who you should think you are. So you are a neomurin, that includes eukaryotes and archaea, eukaryote, animal, metazoan, bilaterian, Coelomate, deuterostome, chordate, vertebrate, 
nathostome, osteichthyan, sarcopterygian tetrapod, amniote, synapsid, mammal, therian, eutherian, euboreotherian, you are contiglare, primate, anthropoid, hominoid, hominid, hominin, homo, homo sapiens. So that's who you think you are. 